The film you see on your screen at this moment was taken from the nose of a United States Air Force reconnaissance airplane flying across country, or down on the desk, as the flyers call it. This is one of the methods used to get the facts about the enemy. The Aeronautical Systems Division at Wright Field is now engaged in developing new and more effective ways of recording enemy movement, placement of arms, airplanes, and buildings. This is our story, the business of watching an enemy from the air and taking his picture on tonight's edition of Technology for Tomorrow. My first guest on tonight's program, Mr. Dan Groves, who is Staff Administrative Officer, Deputy for Technology at Wright Field. Mr. Groves, perhaps we can start it off here tonight by my asking you just how important is reconnaissance to winning a war, sir? Well, it's all important. It's the one necessary ingredient. The mission of the Air Reconnaissance Laboratory is somewhat unique. Other agencies, some here at the base, develop such things as rockets, missiles, and so forth. Things designed to physically eliminate an enemy. But our job is more basic. We try to provide the foundation that will allow such machines of war to uh, operate efficiently. Mm -hmm. You see, our product points out the what and where in enemy terrain. Now, this uh, military watching, whether in wartime or peacetime, is uh, likely to be resented by an enemy. Well, tell in chief, Mr. Groves, I'll ask you now if you can recall any instance where the enemy may have objected to being watched. Yes, uh, I most certainly do. As a newsman, I'm sure that you recall the now famous incident of a strange airplane called the U-2. It seems that someone on our side was trying to figure out what their side had in the way of uh, war material and where it was located. Now, this is a species of intelligence reconnaissance that uh, usually shuns publicity. But in this case, uh, something went wrong that hit the front pages. The techniques that you devised and the instruments you developed, sir, are are actually the heart and soul of military intelligence. Could you agree with that? Uh, yes. Uh, the instruments we devise are, are, are quite necessary. Uh, quite necessary. We just, uh, we just have to have them, Phil. Can you give me an example, sir, where uh, reconnaissance, or the lack of reconnaissance may have changed the course of uh, the military operation? Well, yes, I can uh, give you a good example. No doubt you're uh, familiar with the famous Battle of the Bulge that took place during uh, World War II. Well, this cost many thousand American lives and almost resulted in a complete uh, military catastrophe. As you recall, this was a trip hammer move on the part of the Germans that uh, caught us totally unprepared. Now, how was this surprise attack achieved, and how could it have uh, been prevented? We think the answer is very simple. For three days, our reconnaissance aircraft had been grounded by a heavy cloud cover. The reconnaissance aircraft could not fly. Mm -hmm. Well, if they'd have flown, they'd have brought back uh, pretty pictures of pretty clouds. You see, our air power and ground power were completely paralyzed by lack of information, and the Germans uh, simply took full advantage of this fact. Here's the point. One picture from one flying airplane just might have changed the whole course of history during World War II. Then, in the 1940s, we could not get that picture. But today, with devices in our hands, we can keep an eye on the enemy. We can see him right through cloud cover, and we will find him though he hides in a hole in the ground. And I mean that readily. Having a work with you for the past week. I know you mean that literally, and we'll demonstrate it here in a moment. Mr. Groves, it's my understanding that you're uh, the reconnaissance people at Wright-Patterson use just about every uh, branch of science that you can get your hands on. Is that true? Sir? Oh, yes, that's true. This laboratory will accept, use, and steal any tool that modern science can offer in an attempt to get more military information concerning an enemy. We have men who specialize in invisible light, high-power microwaves, huge lenses, barrel cameras, pyrotechnics, explosives, TV, radio transmission of pictures, the collection of weather data. You know, the necessity for a weather reconnaissance satellite in orbit was recognized by this laboratory some six years ago. It is now the Tyros. Mr. Graves, I'm thankful for this brief background sketch you've given us on the business of watching the enemy, and if you permit me now, sir, I'll take leave of you for a moment. 
and introduce my next guest, who is Colonel Robert Quick, photographic engineer with the Deputy for Technology at Wright Field. Colonel, how long has the business of reconnaissance been going on, sir? Well, we can't claim to be the oldest laboratory at Wright Field, but I think that we can show you that the value of reconnaissance was recognized some time ago by the alert intelligence pilot of a rather unique cargo ship. The ship happens to be the Ark, and the gentleman's name, Noah. In the Bible, in the 8th chapter of Genesis, we find a passage that reads something like this. Again, he sent forth a dove out of the Ark. The dove returned to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters had abated from the face of the earth. The note fell that this was aerial reconnaissance. I do know that, sir. Down through history, we've had numerous instances of the value of reconnaissance. We find that Caesar, Napoleon, Stonewall Jackson, among others, used it. And finally, it even took to the air in World War I. Mr. Graves discussed its value during World War II. And now today, finally, we're installing reconnaissance devices in supersonic vehicles, actually designing it for space, trips to the moon, Mars, Venus, and beyond even. Colonel, this 1961 technology that I'd like to uh, concern myself with at this time, why don't you begin now by being specific and telling me just how you go about getting these unusual pictures. Yes, sir. We use devices or instruments that we call sensors. These are the eyes of our system, so to speak. And as you know, our, our bodies function more efficiently when our five senses operate properly. So it is in a reconnaissance system necessary to use more than one sensor in order to get the complete job done. Now we have uh, talked about cameras. We have the camera sensor, which gives us our sharpest picture. It's weather limited, of course. We have our radar device, which Mr. Graves mentioned. It's, it's this that permits us to see through weather, clouds, and so forth. And we have infrared, which gives us uh, records of objects that radiate heat. We'll hear a little more about that later. Uh, do you have an example of Three these three different types Yes, we have a scene here showing Manhattan Island as viewed by all three of these sensors. On the left, we see the island as recorded by a radar device. In the center, the same scene, this time with a conventional camera, aerial camera, and on the right, the Manhattan recorded by infrared. It appears uh, that the center section of the photograph, that taken by regular light-type photography, is the best. That's the best image. Is that true? It is the sharper, or sharpest of the three, Phil. But uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's necessary to have three different types of sensors in order to get the complete picture. What would determine whether you would use infrared or radar? Probably the type of target that we're going after, the type of weather conditions, the whether it's day or night, or things of this sort. Generally, we try to have as many sensors uh, aboard as, as physically possible. Well, you referenced the terms here that I believe need more explanation, and I now uh, give that mission to uh, Mr. Thomas Wolfe. Mr. Wolfe is presentation specialist for reconnaissance deputy for technology. Mr. Wolfe, as we've heard, the kind of reference such things, uh, animals as IR or infrared. I if you'd kind of give us an explanation of just what is the nature of this beast, IR. Well, to begin with, Phil, we know that all objects above absolute zero radiate heat, each at its own rate. An infrared device can detect the difference in re these radiations and record them on film in picture form. Here is one such picture taken at night over one of the runways here at Wright Field. Keep in mind that the hotter the object, the brighter it will appear. We see several. First is the X painted on the runway, and then right in front of that real bright airplane, we see a little white dot. This is actually the tub which pulled this airplane from the hangar where the environment was warmer. In this next slide, we have a group of five people, the center one being a woman. Because the nylons that she is wearing is retaining her body's heat, her legs appear brighter than the other people in the picture. This is a type of sensor that looks down to the ground to locate objects. Another looks up or out. An important future use of infrared will be airborne early warning of ICBM. Tests conducted at Cape Canaveral have indicated that we can detect incoming ICBMs from great distances. In this next slide, we have synthesized the future early warning satellite. It is a system of detectors orbiting the Earth for the purpose of detecting the launching or presence of incoming missiles. In space, the attenuation of infrared energy is negligible due to the lack 
of atmosphere. We therefore have a potential capability of detecting incoming ICBMs seconds after they are launched. This information then can then be telemetered back to our early warning network and logical countermeasures initiated. If you uh, close mentioned a moment ago that you'd have more to say about the U-2. You forgive my preoccupation with the airplane, so you do have more to say about the U-2? Yes, sir. Not only to say, Phil, but something to look at. Not many people have seen this particular airplane in flight. Here's a short piece of film showing its extraordinarily steep climbing angle. We are using it experimentally at the present time to extend the range of our infrared sensors. On top of the film, or on top of the airplane, we will notice in a minute some of our IR detection equipment. We're about to see that now in a tight shot. This aircraft now will uh, bank right and come down below the camera. And I'll ask the audience to note the uh, unusual uh, bubble on top of the, uh, just behind the cockpit area. This is uh, the item we're referencing at this time. Yes, sir. Now, this is uh, an IR device, is it? This is an IR device. It is exactly the same type of device that I have here at my side. This is our IR detector, and it's exactly the same type of equipment we have installed on top of our airplane. Now, this will record uh, on film, if I can use that term, anything uh, that comes within its scope. Is that right? This is essentially correct. What our ID IR, IR, IR detector picks up is displayed on a cathode ray tube, and then we actually film what we see on this tube. I couldn't help notice, Mr. Wolf, that the device was located on top of the U-2, and I was under the impression that the U-2 took pictures of the ground. Well, in this particular instance, Bill, this equipment was installed on the top of the airplane, mainly for the purpose of detecting missiles and ICBMs. And if you wanted to take the recording of the ground? We could essentially just put it on the bottom of the airplane. I understand. Now, you people have records tonight radar photography, which is in itself a surprising turn to me. I think of radar as a scope with a, a blip on it. I wasn't aware that you could take a picture with it. Well, Phil, I have here a picture of modern pictorial radar. This approaches the quality of low-resolution photography. <coughs> this record was made through cloud from a high-performance, high-flying aircraft. A trained operator can identify specific aircraft types located on the ramp. The range of this picture is dependent upon the altitude of the aircraft. That dark streak down the middle of the picture happens to be the flight path of the airplane. What type of aircraft deploy the uh, radar photography device? Well, in this next slide, we have a B-58. And you will notice underneath the airplane is a long pod, 60 foot in length. This pod contains two 50-foot antennas that look out laterally to either side of the aircraft. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. If I may now, I'll return to Colonel Quick. Colonel, how does aerial, the aerial camera measure up to the other methods of recording uh, that uh, Mr. Wolf has just left Quite well, Phil. The camera actually is in advance of these other two sensors as far as the recording picture detail, and it's detail that gives us our intelligence value. We estimate this detail or resolution in what we call lines per millimeter, meaning the number of lines that a photograph can separate within the one millimeter or about a 25th of an inch. For example, here is an aerial picture of New York City made with a 24-inch standard aerial camera from an altitude of about 50,000 feet. In World War II, we'd have considered this excellent quality. It resolves approximately 25 lines per millimeter. Colonel, what are some of the problems involved in taking we have a number of problems. Actually, one of the most difficult are the vibrations, the small high-frequency vibrations that are caused, induced by the moving parts of an actual camera. We have Mr. Wayne Siegel standing by to operate an aerial camera for us to show you what I mean. Mr. Siegel, if you'd forgive me, sir. Now, every time these parts move, Phil, vibrations are induced. And if these vibrations cause the image in the focal plane to shift by as little as a thousandth of an inch, we'd literally have it on our resolution. Now, uh, if you permit me to digress here, what bothers me is how you can get a clear picture of the ground from an airplane that's moving maybe 600 miles an hour. Why doesn't the picture blur? 
The answer to that is what we call image motion compensation. So notice in the magazine section, the two rolls of film, one is the take up, the other the supply spool. As the aircraft moves across the ground, film is moved across the focus plane. Its velocity is synchronized to that of the ground speed of the aircraft. This essentially minimizes or reduces the uh, relative motion between the uh, film and the ground and keeps our picture sharp. So you solved that problem, and how did you solve the other various moving parts of the camera that disturb it? We found an interesting fact, and that is that the shutter of the camera is one of the main culprits that steals our quality. So to overcome this, we extracted the shutter from the camera and placed it down next to the window in the aircraft, then connected the shutter back to the lens with a light, tight, flexible bellows as shown here. This enabled us to exceed 100 lines per millimeter in our resolution, which, by the way, is a must if we're to get sharp pictures from great distance. It's hard to believe a shutter could uh, affect movement in that large piece of equipment, but it does. It's it does. Well, well, well. Can you give us an example of some of the uh, photographs taken by this new modified camera? We have an aerial picture of Dayton made with this external shutter camera. It might appear just as an ordinary picture at first glance, but our, our interpreter was a Dayton boy, and his attention was directed to the area within the circle near the bottom of the picture. A small speck there appeared to be a parked car. So he had the, this section of the negative enlarged 30 diameters, and sure enough, it was a parked car. We later determined it was a 57 Ford to be there. Now, this is not another photograph. This is a blow-up of a speck. This is a 30 times blow-up of the small section within that circle. Now, I see the car, and I'm trying to find the occupants. <laughs> we found two, Phil. One turned out to be a fisherman. His fishing pole is extended over the water, as you can see. And he has a partner, and he appears to be baiting his hook. Now, we're resolving here from an altitude of about three miles, a fishing pole, one half inch in diameter. It's pretty good, we'll admit, but it's not good enough. And we're striving for the day when we hope we can show you the hook in the wind. And it, when you do, I hope you'll call me with a scoop. Carl, I'm led to uh, conclude that there's no such thing as privacy anymore. That was the Miami River. We that was. Uh, is there any other way, Colonel, that we can get high resolution outside of the methods you've just referenced? There is one other way that we might call it brute force, in this case, sheer size or focal length. In the earlier slide, we talked about high resolution with focal length of 24 inches. Now here's a picture that was made of New York City with a camera whose focal length was some 20 feet in length. This picture, by the way, was made from a distance of 65 miles southeast of New York. Well, I'll call your attention in particular to the objects along the Jersey shoreline and to this building in particular. Recall that previously we needed 30 diameter enlargement to pick up detail. With the, the focal length built in and with the very slight magnification, we could read on the building in question the words here seven. The letters actually measure here six feet in height, and we're doing this from 65 miles away. Now, the focal length of the, of the camera that took for the lens, it took that 20, 20 feet in length. This is essentially a massive lens. Then, this, is, this is quite a large camera. I'm sorry we can't show you the actual mechanism itself. I do have, however, a big camera of an earlier vintage, this one, 1910. As you can see, it took 15 men and a boy just to change the focus. We, we call this one the Bessemer Browning. You, uh, uh, now that we're in the missile age, you, you're forced to reduce the size, mass, weight of, of, of your equipment. You have to have more finesse. Yes, right? we would like to get the biggest camera that we can inside of a, a vehicle. We'd like to put Mount Palomar in there if we could, but there just isn't enough room. But we have to specialize in high-precision high optics and very good quality and all, all through our mechanism, but with limited size. Colonel, getting uh, now down to practical examples of photographs taken during wartime, my question of you is, what are you looking for? What do you try to find in a photograph? We try to find a great variety of things, Bill, that range in size actually from the smallest, such as rivets on a tank, to entire airfields. We look for just about everything within those two limits. You've uh, brought with you some examples of wartime photography, and I uh, say this because if I ask you to, it forces you to be vain, knowing that you flew a number of missions in Korea and elsewhere, taking pictures yourself in uh, battle. I must say to the audience that uh, uh, Colonel Cook is uh, highly qualified to make uh, 
to reference the wartime photography to continue it. We have several here that were taken uh, in Germany during the war. The first one is an aerial view without the photographer's uh, annotations. And the next slide will show how an aerial photo that has been looked at carefully uh, by a trained interpreter would look after he has placed the matters of intelligence interest down. For example, we see here a number of aircraft is not only identified, but counted. Uh, could you point out some of the other details that the photographer was able to derive? The well, case? there are a number of other interesting features here. There are gun emplacements. We can notice gun emplacements, uh, uh, actual storage uh, areas, revetments, uh, 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 runways. The runways, of course, are always of interest. The length of runways would indicate, for example, types of aircraft that uh, would be used and so forth. So there's a wide variety of uh, important intelligence information that can be gained from a single aerial photograph. You have an example, Colonel, of a, a photograph taken at night by way of infrared photography. I don't know if you this, that. Uh, this is a night photograph. This happens to be one of my favorite subjects, by the way. But this is a night picture uh, made uh, over the Irrawaddy River in northern Burma during the, uh, during the War of Japan. Now, I'd like to point out that photography or reconnaissance, to be complete, has got to be continuous. This means that we've got to fly around the clock and be able to detect things that go on at night as well as in the daytime. Aerial uh, daytime pictures showed the bridge had been bombed in this case. We can see that there is no bridge. We can see the pot marks representing the bomb craters. But uh, intelligence uh, had found that the J Japanese were moving supplies and men across the river. How were they doing it? This was the question. To find out, we had to send a special aircraft at night, and this is one of the pictures that it took. And we found out the methods that were being used. A small footbridge was being used to, over which the Japanese were sending their troops, and there were a series of barges, or rowboats, they looked like in this case, uh, which actually floated the trucks and material across the river. Now, this bridge wasn't there during the day, is that it? This, was, was well, we really concealed these things during the, during the daytime hours so that our, our, our eyes in the daytime did, did, could not reveal what was actually going on. Only at night, when they actually came out from undercover and went into their operations, did we actually find out what actually took place and how they, got, how they were making their, how they were fording the river. So, black pockmarks, circular pockmarks near the road, are those? These are the craters that were left by the uh, bombardment aircraft as they bombed and, and knocked out the main bridge. And it was these that uh, actually, uh, uh, we thought from these that we had done the job, but it was not complete. This was a sneaky enemy then. It was indeed, Wolf. Well. If we could have the next slide, uh, this also was an actual wartime photograph, is it, Nelson? Yes, this was made uh, during the uh, uh, Korean focus and is a dicing shot, a low altitude, forward or bright picture in which we can practically look into the front doors of these uh, buildings that we find here. Uh, this uh, gives you an idea of what a, a low-altitude uh, dicing-type picture can reveal to us. Next slide, please. Here's a, an interesting spread. This was the uh, Incheon invasion. The landing forces uh, had a, a, a very important problem to face, and that was the height of the seawall uh, for various times of the day. You see, the tide uh, varies in height, and the landing forces needed to know at precisely the hour of the landing how high the wall would be that they had to scale. We took an aircraft with a Dyson camera in it and were able to evaluate and determine the height of this wall for the exact hour of the invasion within a matter of a few inches. This is the two-page spread that appeared in Life magazine showing the invasion at that actual time. Next slide, please. Here is uh, another low-altitude uh, photograph. The aircraft in front that we're looking at there is, is dropping uh, uh, its shells, its uh, armament, uh, on a uh, uh, innocent-looking hut. But inside that hut, there was a tank. The hut is just below there, and the, uh, we found that an enemy tank had been concealed. We found this by way of photography? We found this by way of photography, and we were, we were able to actually send out attacking aircraft to destroy, in this case, the, uh, the tank. You said this was Korea? This is also Korea, yes, sir. We did quite a bit of picture-taking then during Korea. Quite, quite a lot of picture-taking was in order in this type of uh, operation, yes, sir.
Colonel, I'm thankful uh, to you for this uh, learning account of uh, some of the more important photographs taken during actual wartime. Mr. Groves, if I may, sir, I'd like to return to you and ask you a question that perhaps has occurred to the viewer, not only during tonight's program, but during the U2 incident as well. There are some among us who feel that espionage or reconnaissance is, is not it, that uh, we shouldn't peek. How, how do you respond to this type of philosophy? Well, everyone performs reconnaissance uh, every chance he gets. It's just one of the uh, rules of the game. Now, when it comes to playing this game, I think our moral standards in this country are uh, as high as anybody's. I'm confident that every American would be willing to uh, die if it's necessary for his country, but there might be more wisdom in making the other fellow die for his country. Reconnaissance, you see, is a two-bladed sword. It is not only of great value for fighting and winning wars, as we've seen tonight, but we think it can be a powerful weapon in preventing other wars. Just how, think how wonderful it would be if all of the big countries of this world could be made to see the wisdom of around-the-clock photography so that everyone knew about the honorable intentions uh, of his neighbors. I'm sure that we would all sleep better every night. Mr. Groves, my thanks to you, and my gratitude is extended equally to Mr. Wolf and Colonel Cook, uh, and all the people who work behind the scenes, Mr. Theo, uh, who helped us quite a bit at the base. On behalf of uh, all these people, your kind group, I'm thankful that you've afforded us an interesting and informative television program tonight. On behalf of my guests, I bid you good night. We Americans have become extremely complacent about our capability for fighting and winning wars. The thought of losing one never enters our heads. Other people, however, pause, examine, and consider, perhaps even worry. For example, a very wise Englishman said to Franklin D. Roosevelt during World War II, I hope that in war your country will never be defeated. I'm sure we all applaud that generous wish and hope that it will hold true in these dangerous times. And we believe most earnestly that reconnaissance is insurance against such defeat safety against enemy surprise attack, the prevention of any of us ever hearing within our borders the approaching scream of an incoming death-laden enemy missile. 